went to Michigan. We moved to Michigan. We went to a church, First Baptist Church of Troy, Pastor Mike Harding, still the pastor there. Uh, we got involved, and one of the things we did was we worked in the, uh, the, the toddlers. We worked in the toddler nursery, and I still remember as we worked there, uh, a couple of the pastoral staff had twins. Pastor Harding and his wife had Rachel and Rebecca, and then Pastor Steve Allen and his wife had Kimmy and Katie Allen, and we had Kimmy and Katie as toddlers, and I still remember uh, we had one little girl named Nikki. In fact, this is what brought this up, brought it to my memory. Uh, well, Rhonda mentioned Nikki is getting married, so one of our toddlers is getting married today, actually. All right, yesterday. Got married yesterday, sorry. Got married yesterday, and Nikki was the one that would help us know the difference between Kimmy and Katie. You know, they were, they looked so much alike, you'd almost say there was no distinction, yet Kimmy would help, I mean, uh, Nikki would help us to distinguish between the two, and uh, you've had that experience with twins, they can look amazingly the same, yet clearly very different people. Uh, This morning, as we go back into Romans, and uh, we're looking at an issue, in fact, I titled this, No Distinction Yet Different. No Distinction Yet Different. Beginning in Romans 9, Paul addresses the spiritual plight of Israel, which is a good question because he's bringing the gospel and he's he's mentioned this this whole epistle, this letter to the believers in Rome is around this great reality of the gospel message and this power of God to salvation of all who believe, which obviously leads and should lead to that question, well, what happened to Israel? Because they were God's covenant people, God brought the covenant to them and the Old Testament revelation to them, and so Paul deals with that issue in the plight of Israel. And while they were a distinct and unique people in terms of God's program, and and still are, uh, when it came to the spiritual condition, they were really no different than everyone else, no different than the rest of humanity. And throughout Romans 9 through 11, he's explaining God's dealing with Israel, and in so doing, providing a number of principles principles that really apply to all humanity. While Israel was different in many ways when it comes to the issue of salvation and their own need, uh, their need is the same and the response is the same. There is no distinction when it comes to spiritual condition or the fundamental need of all humanity. What makes us different from one another is not our ethnicity, It's not our our genetics, it's not our gender, it's not our social economic status. What fundamentally makes the difference between all humanity is their response to God's revelation. Your response is what makes the difference. As we come together this morning, one of the things, the reality that I hope that we gain even more even you know as as God grows us up spiritually one of the realities that needs to set ever deeper in our heart is that when we come to church we have to combat this simple I mean we're all creatures of habit okay some of you got up this morning and you did all kinds of things getting ready that you never really thought twice about you just do your routine some of you drove to church this morning about the time you really got the parking lot you went wow did I I'm already here you couldn't remember the turns on the way. You just, you, you're on autopilot, so to speak. Well, that, that ability to make things a habit so we do them over and over without thinking is helpful ability. But it's also a dangerous thing when it comes to worship. Because some of you already have put it in, you're in routine mode. You got here, you came in, you found your Bible, you found your favorite seat, your seat, and you sat down. I mean, it was all on autopilot. Boom, you're here. All right, now we can go through that kind of motion and worship and actually offend the living God. Okay? We've entered into the presence of the living God to offer ourselves in worship. That's a scary thought. It should be. It should be. I mean, it should not so much be scary as just humbling. And it ought to be that reality that I've come before God. And, and here's one of the things about it. As we come and we enter, uh, we've come in this sense, distinct people, but yet we all have the same kind of need. There is no distinction in this reality. Everyone in this room needs to hear from God today. Without exception, everyone in this room has spiritual needs today. Without exception, everyone in this room is struggling with sin somewhere in your life. Without exception, everyone in this room faces some level of suffering, physical, emotional, some dynamic of living in a fallen world that creates difficulty and pain. 
Everyone in this room needs grace today. And we need grace to teach us to say no to the things in our life that ought not be there. And we need grace to teach us to say yes to God and to righteousness and to the truth and to actually see it. Everyone in here needs spiritual eyes to be opened by God himself that we would behold more of the glory of God so that we would not just go through an activity but we actually would be changed. Everyone in here needs to be changed by the power of God. You cannot change yourself. Moral reformation led by you will always fall woefully short of what God is really after. God is after you, all of you, your heart, and the transformation of your character to make you more like himself. God is not interested in half-hearted worshipers. You were made to be a worshiper, created by God himself, and the fundamental duty of all humanity is to be a worshiper of the one true and living God, to hear from him and respond to his revelation in the obedience that faith really produces. We've, we're, we're praying through Psalm 119, and it's not really a commercial for Wednesday night. It is really tying this all together that we, do we want you to come out on Wednesday night and be a part of prayer service? Absolutely. Why? Because we believe the church that's going to please God is going to be a praying church. That's what we believe. We believe a church that's going to have the blessing of God on ministry is going to be a praying church. That's what we believe. And we know that we need to pray together for one another and for the work of the ministry. And so we structure life that way. And on Wednesday night, I, I'm enjoying, and we're, we thought it would be very appropriate for us to read through Psalm 119 because it's all about the Word of God. It's about delighting in the Word. In fact, the theme word throughout is the word delight. And, and we want to you, we want us as a church congregation to grow in our delight over God's word. Folks, one of the good news about today is we still, and how long we'll have this freedom, who knows? I don't know what God's going to do with America. God knows. He knows best. Amen? But you know what? Right now today, you and I still enjoy the freedom to come in together in Berea Baptist Church and worship God together. That's a great freedom. I have no idea how long that'll last. I'm getting on a plane. Maybe it's making me cognitive of it. I'm going to go help teach some guys over there that don't have the freedom you and I have. They risk a whole lot more to gather, but their people gather because it's a delight to them to be in the presence of God. It's a thrill to them to be instructed in God's word. They're eager recipients. We go for eight to ten hours every day. They get to listen to me for that long. And you really do need to pray for them. You think you need to pray for me, right? <laughs> pray for them. I mean, it's eight hours of teaching a day. We go for two weeks, and, they, and, and they're still, they, they would like me to stay longer. And, and these are pastors who then are going to go around, and they're going to teach their people, and their services go uh, a lot longer than ours do. They just do. They don't necessarily, sometimes they don't get to meet weekly. They do try to meet weekly weekly. Sometimes they're not able because sometimes the persecution level is at a point where they have to avoid and then go to another, find another meeting place. There's all kinds of things that they face that you and I have just don't even think about. We've come to the presence of God today, and, and again, as Psalm 119 just captures some of these realities. As the psalmist said in verse 18, Open my eyes and behold wondrous things from your law. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. And, and that statement was just a really convicting statement to me. And, and I, I hope it is to you, and I, I would pray, and I've been praying this way, Lord, make this true in my own life, in the lives of the people of Berea Baptist Church, that we would be consumed by a longing to please you. That there would be nothing that would be more captivating in our hearts and our mind during the week than this thought that all that I am doing, all that I do as I carry out my responsibilities in workplace and with my family and all those interactions, Lord, I want to please you. I want to know what pleases you and live that way. I want to do that. 
That, that's what we come together and worship, to grow in that understanding. And so we come and really going to pick up at the end of last week, Romans 10, 12, and 13, as we move into the focal point of our text, which is 14 through 21. But here's this no distinctions, and no distinction yet different. There in verse 10 and 12, or 12 and 13, he says, For there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved saved. And what a tremendous tax, what a tremendous statement. I mean, Jew and Gentile, and he really, Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, he just really says, look, among people there's no difference when it comes to the issue of salvation. All men have the same fundamental need. They all have the same need, and here's the other side of it. There is no distinction when it comes to who is Lord either. Know what it says about Jesus? He is Lord of all. And until somebody comes, in fact, to call on the name of the Lord, tremendous concept, it is that part of that recognition that he indeed is sovereign, ruling king. He is the one before whom all people will stand. He alone is rich in grace and mercy. He alone can save and deliver from the just deserts of our sin. He alone can transform someone from a kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He alone delivers people from a dominion of sin and, the destined, and, and being destined to destruction to a life dominated by righteousness that will be rewarded with eternal glory. He alone can do that. There's no distinction when it comes to who is Lord. There is no distinction when it comes to how humanity needs to be saved or how can anyone be saved. And Paul sets forth that universal principle, everyone, without exception, who would call in the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, one of the difficulties I have with this text is the way that it has been kind of rolled out. What do I mean by that? Well, to call, we normally think of calling as prayer, right? And I have no problem with joining the idea of call and prayer together, but the way this text has been rolled out in so many circles, in so many ways, is if you get somebody to pray a prayer that calls Jesus Lord and says, please save me, that equals going to heaven. That is simply not what Paul is saying here. There's the idea, the concept that you could pray some magic formula words and bind God to save you is a foreign concept to the scripture. It's a foreign concept to, to this text. This calling is used of one coming in submission and recognition of the authority of the one to whom he calls on. This is not just, a, just this blanket call. It's not, it, you can't just make some, some routine ritual. You, you can't come to church, go through a ritual, and God be pleased. That's just not possible. You can't pray some blanket prayer, boom, you're right with God. That's not possible. Calling is here comes to this recognition that I am a desperately needed sinner who cannot save myself. Until, friend, you've ever recognized this, you've never called. I don't care what prayer you prayed. I don't care what date got wrote in the front of your Bible. Until you've actually understood the gospel, you can't possibly be saved. And the gospel does not say, pray a prayer, go to heaven. You don't find that in the Bible. The gospel says you're a desperately lost sinner who can't save yourself. And that you're a rebel against an authority, the one who is Lord, is authority. And you've been living in rebellion to that authority, and the calling on the name of the Lord demands the submission to that authority, or else, my friends, you've never called. To, to, to call on the name of Christ is to bow your will under his authority. It is to surrender to the king. You can't be in rebellion against the king and love him. I hope that makes sense. Jesus would put it this way. If you're going to follow me, you deny yourself. Take up a cross. Die to that self-life. Come in submission to the one you've been in rebellion and follow. And so this universal principle is absolutely true. Everyone that calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But that calling demands a recognition of your need and the ability of the one you're calling on to save you. 
If you think you prayed a prayer, that equals going to heaven, or you think you took a wafer, took some juice or wine, whatever it is you took, and, that, and, and you think that's going to get you to heaven, you think you're going to go through a baptismal tank and that's going to get you to heaven, then you think you're going to heaven based on something you did. And the Bible stands in absolute contradiction to that. You will never go to heaven based on something you did. You can only go to heaven based on something Jesus did. And, and until you recognize that fundamental difference, friend, you're, you, 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 you're in spiritual need, great need. And throughout this section, as Paul sets forth this principle, he then turns and, and, and now begins answering the question, what has to happen? in order for people to call. What is going to have to happen in order for people to call? Verses uh, 14 through 15, we see no distinction. Beautiful feet must proclaim the best need for all need to hear. The no distinction side comes to this. This is the best news or the greatest news that everyone needs to hear. And he makes that reference, and we'll get there, but he makes that reference to the, to the passage in Isaiah about the messengers having beautiful feet. But he, he says, how will they call? And really begins with a series of rhetorical questions. Each one builds. It's like a series of links in a chain. They're all interconnected in thought, all moving closer and closer to the ultimate point. They all begin with the statement of how. The verb at the end of it uh, is then picked up in the very next statement. So you see, how will they call on him who they've not believed? Now the verb at the end, how will they believe in whom who they have not heard? Now we'll pick up heard. And how will they to hear without someone preaching? Then pick up preaching. How are they to preach unless someone is sent as it is written? And then he drives at the reality as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so he links this series of statements to drive home what must happen. Everyone that calls in the name of the Lord can be saved, right? Will be saved, not can be. You know, it's not pray a prayer and hope somebody makes it to heaven. Everyone who calls, everyone who comes to that humble recognition of their own sinfulness and to Jesus as the Savior and bows to the Savior and calls on him to save them will be saved. God saves them. In fact, he even links it here. They call because they've believed. They believe. They believe this is true. They come to understand the truth of the gospel in their own need and how great a Savior Jesus is, and they call. Because that's who calls. Who calls? Well, the people who believe. Who believe what? Who believe in Jesus. Who really believe the message of, of the gospel. They're the ones who will call. So they believe. But how is that ever going to happen? How are people ever going to come to faith? Well, they need to hear. Well, hearing has more to do, in fact, the whole concept, biblical concept of hearing. You know, you, if you, you know, if you've ever told your kids to do something and they didn't do it and you came back later and said, hey, I told you, and they said, yes, yes, I know, I heard you. I don't know if that, maybe you're a more sanctified parent than I am, but anytime I've told one of my kids to do something, go back to tell them again, and they're saying, yeah, yeah, I heard you, uh, that one doesn't sit well with me. That one really kind of lights my fire because it's like, no, you didn't. Well, yeah, I heard what you said. Yeah, but you didn't hear me. Because if you really heard me, then you would have done what you were asked to do. We understand that we, I mean, we really do understand. God has not asked for us just merely to come to church and hear something today. Okay. God, God, you think about it, you come to worship God, do you think God's going to just be excited in heaven, he's going to stand up and dance a jig around the throne of God and say, boy, I'm so glad they came and they heard my word today. He's going to be thrilled that you came and listened. Really? You know better. God has not asked you simply to come sit down in a chair and, and sit for however long this guy goes on, listen to some words, walk out and say, well, that was my church thing today. Did my worship duty. God's got to be thrilled with me today. Now I think I can pray and ask God to do some things for me because after all, I did something for him. Now that's the way most Americans worship, folks. That's the way a lot of Americans worship God. Hey, I got my worship thing done. Did my little church duty. Now God, you need to do something for me. I did something for you. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't have any needs. You didn't enter the presence of a needy God this morning. You came as a needy sinner needing him, not the other way around. If we don't get that one right, we don't worship, folks. 
If we don't get this text right, then we don't do evangelism, which is obviously very near to the heart of God. He gave his son for that sake. How important is evangelism to God? His son died that sinners might be saved. It's pretty important, isn't it? The question I ask for you this morning and throughout this message is this, how important is it to you? How important is sharing the greatest news that's ever been heard with others who need to hear it? How important is that to you? If it's not important to you, if you're just busy about going about doing your thing and living life and living large and in charge, we're missing something really bad. The Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross of Calvary to set you free from the penalty, the burden, the bondage of sin, to call you out of it, that you would be as God's very own child. And now he's done something. He's called you to himself. You've believed. You heard. And now you're sent to share that message with others, aren't you? Folks, we are. I mean, that's his string. He's, he's going, look, how are people going to hear unless somebody tells them Unless somebody preaches, you say, well, see, it's that preaching word. That's the, your job, Pastor, and Ted's job, and those are the, the preacher's jobs. They're the ones that are supposed to get the gospel out. Well, the word translated to preach here is really a word that speaks of the office of a herald. It is not the biblical office of pastor, although the pastor does carry out being a herald. He functions that way, but this is not a title text like preaching this is not like referred to a pastor preaching it's referred to the herald who's been given an entrustment to take a message forward so how will they hear unless someone tells them the heralds have been sent that's his next point how are they ever going to hear unless someone tells them well how are they ever going to be told unless somebody sends the messengers and his whole point is the messengers have been sent they have been sent if you're a child of God here today, you have been sent by God as an ambassador, as a herald. We can use a lot of different languages here. But you are called as an official herald to function in that capacity as a part of taking the gospel and making it known to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, it says really the references to God. God's entrusting to us a message of reconciliation. I mean, you know what an entrustment is? God has put a deposit in account in your life. And he said, here's this glorious message, this gospel message that you believed, you turned, repented, believed, you've been reconciled to God, you enjoy the fruit of this message, and now as one who has been entrusted with that message, therefore we're ambassadors of Christ. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. When's the last time you implored anyone to be saved? When's the last time you implored anyone to be saved? When's the last time you wept over the lost condition of the people on your evangelistic prayer list? Now that's a big assumption that you have one. Who are the lost people you're praying for and you're seeking to have opportunity to share the gospel with them? Who are they? How will they believe if they do not hear? How will they hear unless somebody tells them? And how will somebody ever go and tell them unless they've been sent? Well, I've got news for you. If you're here as a child of God, you've been sent by God himself. Jesus Christ, in his great high priestly prayer for us, says, I, as you sent me into the world, praying to the Father, Father, you've sent me into the world. So I have sent them, speaking of the apostles, but all, of his, all the believers, I'm sending them into the world. For their sake I concentrate my, consecrate myself. They may also uh, be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for them only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Folks, that, that, that's a tremendous truth. Do you recognize Jesus prayed before he ever ascended to heaven? That he, 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 he taught the disciples right there, and he said, look, this is what I am praying for you. The Father has sent me into the world. I'm sending you into the world, and here's what's going to happen. Others are going to believe through your word. God wants you to tell other people the gospel, doesn't he? 
He wants you. In fact, he's not more than just want you to. He's commissioned and sent you to. Folks, if we dismiss evangelism and sharing the gospel out from our daily living, if it's just one of those things that maybe we have Operation Good Neighbor here and there and we'll show up for, or visitation here or there, every now and then we get burdened, we'll put a couple tracts in our pocket and hand it out here or there, and we just make evangelism that occasional activity, something that every now and then we're going to be a part of, we're, I think, out of step with the heart of God here. I don't think we really have the same heart that God has about it or that he really wants and commands us to have. And part of the point that Paul's going to make in this text is, look, there is no distinction in spiritual need. There's a distinction in response. And not everyone who hears the message ever responds to it. There are people who disobey the message and there are people who believe it, but faith obeys. And the just live by faith. Now, I I want to be as careful as I can, but I want to be as direct as I can. Folks, you and I have been commanded to take the gospel forward. We're ambassadors, we're heralds, we've been commissioned. To do less is to disobey our God. To do less is to not live by faith. It is to fail, fundamentally fail, to love God Right? And it, 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 it is that, I mean, that, that sounds a little harsh. But if I am not, don't have the same heart for taking the gospel forward that God himself has, then I'm not loving God like I should. Not even close. Not even close. You see, as he comes at verse 15 again, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And we don't often think about feet as beautiful. If you do, I don't want to know about it. The idea really of beautiful in this text is something that arrives at the right time. It's timely. It's what's needed. It came at the very time it was most needed. Thus, it's beautiful. It's lovely. And Isaiah, he's picking up on Isaiah's emphasis on the messengers. You know, in in biblical times, the messengers didn't have cars, airplanes, They didn't have all this other stuff. They went from place to place. They traveled and they usually wore sandals and their feet got filthy. And when they showed up at a place, a good host would have somebody wash their feet. And that job of feet washing was always left to the most menial, it was the most menial of tasks, the lowest of servant, the lowest of rank socially was supposed to do. That's why John 13 is such an amazing text when the Lord of glory washes his disciples' feet. But in this context, beautiful feet are actually dirty feet. They're actually filthy feet. Because their feet busied, engaged in carrying forth the gospel message, taking this message to others. And it reminds me of this passage in Peter. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. So in our hearts, in my life, honor Christ. And honor Christ as the one who is holy and set apart from sin. And if I'm going to do that, then it commands on me to always be ready. Always be ready to make a defense, to give a reason for the hope, to step forth the gospel message. Always be ready to share the truth of the gospel. Always ready. Always prepared. Folks, I wish I was always ready and always prepared. It's so easy to get distracted and fixed on the task that's in front of me and you're busy doing this one and doing that one that you just miss the opportunity to share the gospel because you're not ready. You're not thinking that way. And that's an area in which we all need God to recapture our mind and our hearts and our thinking. There is nothing more important than sharing the good news of the gospel. God has you where he has you with the people in your life that he has you there because he wants you to share the good news with them. Not just do business with them and not just carry out this duty and that duty and work alongside. God has you there of a witness of the most incredible news that could ever be shared. It is the best thing that everyone needs to hear 
And God wants you and I to really believe that. And if we really believe that, then we will get more passionate about sharing it. We'll always be ready. And when he emphasizes this good news, he uses the verb, which is we, euangelizo, which is to share the good news or proclaim the good news. So in, encompassed in the verb itself is the idea of good news. But he also then adds the, the adjective good, that which is morally excellent. So he really is saying, hey, go preach the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news that is good. I mean, this news is so good, I've got to emphasize it. it. It's that good. That's what he's saying. I mean, folks, he, he wants you to be excited about this. God gave you the gospel. Quit being embarrassed by that. Don't be embarrassed to be a witness. Don't act like you've got bad news to share. You've got the best news that ever has been shared with anyone. That's what you have in your hand. And if we don't believe the gospel is the best news ever, then there's something really wrong. Either we've never really believed it ourselves, Friend, if, if the gospel's not the best news you ever heard, then I, I have to ask you, have you ever really trusted Christ, seen your helpless sinfulness, repented and believed? Have you experienced the love of God that sets you free from other loves, that God's love begins to fill you up and you begin to delight in God and the things of God, which means you're going to delight in the message of God's Son? If I don't delight in God's Son, I'm not delighting in God. If I delight in God's Son, that means I must delight in the message of Christ and the gospel itself. It is the greatest news. Why do we not see it that way? I know we live in a culture that's hostile to the gospel, I mean, I know the people working around you don't want to hear your good news. They don't think it's good news, do they? They want to hear, I'm okay, you're okay, everybody do your own thing. Right? I mean, that's what they want to hear. Hey, you've got your beliefs, I've got mine, mine are going to work out, yours can work out. We can just all get along, we all kind of believe in the same God, or I don't even believe in God, good that you do, but just let me do my thing. That's what every, I mean, they just leave me alone. I'm good, I'm okay. They're not okay. They're not even close to okay. They're lost and they're dying and they're going to end up in a Christless eternity. And you know what? You've got the message of deliverance. You say, but I also have to tell them they're lost and that's just hard. Well, have you ever been lost? Some of you guys have been lost and you, knew, you, you, you acted like you weren't because you wouldn't look at the map or the GPS. Or some of you got the GPS that you know, did, the, did the sent you out somewhere and you ended up at a bridge abutment someplace and thought, oh, this is great. It didn't really work out so well. I mean, we've been lost and when you're lost, you know what? If you don't know you're lost, you just kind of spend a lot of time going nowhere or a long way the wrong way. Yes, folks, we do have to tell people they're lost. But that's not all I have to say, is it? I understand that in sharing the gospel that I'm sharing that something that people don't want to hear and that I'm sharing with the reality that they're a sinner before Almighty God. But you know what? It's not like I'm going up to him and saying, hey, Bob, you know what? You're a sinner, and I'm not. I'm not doing that. I'm not going up to Bob and saying, Bob, you know, you're a sinner. You're a horrible person. You're on your way to hell, and I'm, this, I'm not. No, I'm a sinner just like Bob's a sinner. And as I go to share the gospel with someone, now Bob knows the Lord. I'm just, but if I, I'm sharing the gospel, I'm not coming and saying, look, I'm condemning you because you're a sinner and I'm somehow better than you. If you do that, no wonder people run from you. Okay, that's not what the gospel demands. I have the greatest news ever to share because you know what, Bob and I share something. We're both sinners. And we're both sinners who, who, who have lived our own way in rebellion against God, and it's brought some really ugly fruit in our lives. And it continues to bring a lot of ugly fruit all around the country we live in. We have the fruit of sin is everywhere present, folks. If you can't connect with people on the fruit of sin, then, then you don't, your eyes are closed or something. We live in a culture that's just reaping a harvest of the fruit of sin. And everybody's lives are impacted by that. And their lives are being impacted by the destruction that sin has brought about. And you now have the opportunity to come alongside and say, listen, we're all sinners. And the destruction that sin is bringing our society, it brings our own personal lives. And I don't know where it's, you're experiencing your own life, but sin always brings destruction. 
But the good news is the God of heaven loves sinners like you and me. And how much he loves us is he gave his own son on a cross of Calvary to pay the debt that our sin deserves. And it gets even better than that. He rescues us from the power of sin. Did you know that you can actually live in victory over sin? You don't have to live as its slave and its servant anymore. You can live a life now under the dominion of God himself, a life that really has meaning and purpose forever because apart from Christ, life has no meaning. You have the greatest news that could ever be shared. Please, please, whatever it is in your heart that's keeping you from believing that, you need to ask God to open your eyes and get rid of that because it's sin and it's killing your witness it's killing your witness. You're not going to witness to something you don't think people need. You're not going to witness to something you don't believe is good. You're going to bow out and say, well, they don't want to hear it. They, they have to hear it. They cannot be saved. They cannot call on the name of the Lord. They are going to be lost forever unless somebody tells them the good news and somebody has to be sent with it and God sent you. So share. Tell the good news. And tell it like it is really good news. One of the things that uh, have stood out in the, uh, our men's Bible study, and I have a lot, it's just this, this truth, it affects our witness, it affects everything about it. It's just this, we radically, we radically undervalue the gift of God in his son and his grace. We're not captured in our hearts by holiness and the wonder of saving grace. And I'm gonna paraphrase a paragraph that really stuck out to me and burdened my heart from our men's Bible study. If you're a child of God here today, consider what God has done in your life. The Lord Jesus Christ has invaded your life with his grace. He has done for you what you could never do for yourself. His grace has rescued you from the power of sin, something no law, not even religious law, could ever do. He's lavished upon you his love in your most in in your most delusional moments of self grandeur. You should not imagine that you deserve it. He will never leave you or forsake you, even in your most arrogant moments. He does not mock our weaknesses or throw our sin back in your face. He forgives, he cleans, he's faithful when you don't have enough sense to be. He fights on your behalf even when you're too lazy to do so. He will not quit until his work of redemption is complete. He has prepared for you an eternal home and guarantees that the glories of dwelling together in his kingdom will far outweigh the difficulties of living in a fallen world. The eternal significance of this treasure, knowing and loving and serving Christ, defies all human vocabulary. Is Christ really your treasure? If he is, then your feet are going to be beautiful. And why will your feet be beautiful? Because you're going to be telling the good news. Tell the good news. The distinction, no difference. I mean, no no distinction in the fact that all need to hear this news. No distinction, this reality, that those who have heard the news and have believed it need to share it. The difference comes in the response to the news. Hearing is not equal receiving. And that's what he draws into. He says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed or heard, uh, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And so now he centers on, okay, what has to happen in order for people to call in the name of the Lord to be saved? Well, someone has to share it. And those someones that are going to share it have to be sent, and God has sent his messengers, and they're coming with good news. I mean, it really is the imagery of the battle being won and the news being announced. People are in the prison of sin and they need to be released and someone needs to to win their pardon and Christ has won their pardon and you're the messenger riding in to share the good news. Now go. But what then must happen? What does it mean in hearing? Why don't all everyone that hears believes? Because there's something fundamentally missing. Faith. Faith is a gift of God. 
and he links, and this is an important linking section here because he links some concepts together that you and I need to get right. He links obeying, believing, and faith. We live in a day today where so many people say the gospel is, just, is, is like this intellectual ascent. Thus you pray a prayer, go to heaven. Thus you get a confirmation, go to heaven. Thus you do this thing, go to heaven. It, it, faith is just this individualistic thing that you make some intellectual decision to say you believe in Jesus and that's good, that's what faith is. Faith can never be minimalized like that. The Bible doesn't allow you to do that. It interchanges the words together to draw a wholesale picture of faith. That faith is so much a larger concept than just a belief and intellectualized. Faith always involves somebody coming in submission to the one they're in a rebellion against and obeying that authority. Faith is always obedient. It produces obedience. Those who do not obey the gospel will be destroyed by God himself. The gospel is far more. It is an invitation. It is a rescue statement. It is sent to perishing people to say you can be rescued from perishing. But it is also a command. It is a command to sinners to repent and believe and be reconciled to God. And so the gospel is all of that and it demands that kind of response. Paul would even say in Romans chapter 1, and he put these texts together in Romans 1, he's a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Verse 5, through whom we receive grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations. What does the gospel produce? It produces people who are radically changed by the gospel from those who were once rebels against God to those who now live by faith, and that faith produces obedience those who do not obey the gospel when the gospel is proclaimed it calls on all men to submit their hearts recognize their rebellion come in submission to christ in fact that obedience link and there's a couple other texts i'll put up here in the obedience link in in hebrews chapter 5 he says jesus is the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him Second Thessalonians, in case you think obedience isn't really all that big a deal, God is going to return, and when Jesus Christ returns with his holy angels, that's the context of Second Thessalonians 1.8, you can look it up, but the, he's coming again, his angels coming in play, and inf- inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. To know God is to obey the gospel. Folks, the gospel comes with an invitation that is true. But it is bigger than an invitation. It is also the command of the one true and living God that comes to all sinners and says, you've been in rebellion against me and you must submit, uh, you must turn from that rebellion, submit your heart to the authority against whom you've been a rebel. Repent, believe, trust me. And that trust will always flesh out in a new heart that obeys, loves, and obeys God. And so we come with the greatest news that can ever be shared, but we come with an authoritative message that calls on men to turn, repent, and believe. Folks, it's great news. Is it compelling news? It is. Because here's the side of it that sinners don't. I mean, and, and, and you're here today if you've never been reconciled to God. If you've never been a day where you submitted your heart to Christ and trusted him as Savior, then friend, let me compel you. Let me implore you. Today be reconciled to God because you do not know how many days God will continue to be patient with you. As you see things continue to wax and worse and worse in our society, this is the good news for a believer. The day is soon coming when Jesus Christ himself is returning. And he's going to call his church home and he's going to enter into judgment and all who have not obeyed the gospel will be destroyed. But that's what I deserve I mean, I deserve that destruction. That's why I should be amazed that God would love and save me. That's why I should be compelled to take this message to others who are lost in their sin. I said, yeah, but they're so hard. So were you. They're so lost. Their lives are so marred by sin. So was yours. Your life was dominated by that. You still have sin in your life, and the sin in your life is just as ugly as the sin in their life. We don't think of it that way. We think, well, those sinners out there, they're doing all this bad stuff. I mean, they're drugs, they're alcohol, they're killing babies, they're doing this. It's horrible. It is horrible. 
Well, those are, that's the really bad stuff. Our sins, well, they're just not that bad. Folks, no sin in your life is any less egregious to God than the sin in an unbeliever's life. It is just as offensive. It deserves just as much judgment. You've been sent to take a message of rescue, a message of love and deliverance, the greatest news that's ever been given to people whose lives are being marred by sin, but you've not been sent as one who does not know what sin does in a life. You know it very well. You're one whose sin continues to mark your life. And we've been called to be people who not only proclaim the gospel, but live it. What does it mean to live it? It means I'd live with the everyday reality that, God, I'm a sinner before you, and every day I need your forgiveness, I need your grace, because apart from it, I'm going to sin. It means I've never one day thought I'm earning favor with God, I don't think I'm meriting favor with God, that every day I come and as I, as I should approach the day, I should approach it with this gospel mindset, you know, I'm a sinner saved by grace. It's an amazing grace that God has given me. That I deserve every day to God of heaven to strike me and, and, and make me an object of nothing more than his wrath. And the fact that he hasn't made me an object of his wrath is all of grace, nothing of merit. And it's all because of Christ. And because Christ has saved and loves me and continues to love me, I am to live this life by faith. Trusting God, obeying God, growing in love for God, growing and delighting in God. And that should resound out of my life in sharing the gospel message with others, shouldn't it? If I'm delighting in God, then I'm going to delight to share God with others. And yes, some are not going to obey. Some are not going to submit their hearts. But folks, when they don't submit their hearts, the response is not, well, pfft. Well, I guess you're going to get what you deserve. Response should be broken. You know what, God, you, in your grace, you opened my eyes and I saw. And I understood and I repented and I believed. Lord, you need to do the same thing in their life. They don't see. They've been blinded by sin. They've been blinded by the culture around them that taught them to glory in things that are shameful. And their lives are so trapped. They're trapped in sin and they, they can't deliver themselves. And they're lost and they're hopeless. And God, you saved me, and why you saved me, I don't know, but I'm amazed that you would grant me, this sinner, salvation and call me to yourself and give me the opportunity to take that message to others, and they need to hear it. But Lord, they don't have the ears to hear, and they don't have the eyes to see. But you and you alone can change all of that. Because as he goes on and tells their very nature, Go on to the next one, I'm sorry. The very nature, and this is not just Israel, because he is focused on Israel, because why is Israel here? Well, haven't they heard? Well, yeah, they've heard. Shouldn't they understand? Well, yeah, they should understand. But what's wrong? Well, he says, all day long I've held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. In the midst of that, he tells, you know, what is God doing with Israel's rejection? God is calling out Gentiles to himself and making them his people. Somebody that was not his people becoming his people so that Israel might become jealous and be brought to repentance, that their heart might be broken for their rejection of their Messiah, that God might draw them to himself. You know what? That's the topic of the next chapter. God is going to save Israel. And he's using his work among the Gentiles to draw their hearts to himself. That's what God's doing. But why don't they believe today? Because this is their nature. But what an amazing picture, and I want to leave this picture with you. The God of heaven says, I extend my hands day after day. The gospel message goes forth. The God of heaven is extending his hands. See, friend, if you're here without Christ, this is you. The God of heaven extends his hands to you and you are on the edge of a precipice and you're hanging on by your fingertips and your grip is slipping and the God of heaven is reaching out and saying, take my hand. Because you're about to plummet to eternal destruction. Take my hand. And you know what we won't do? We won't stick our hands forward. Because we're a disobedient and contrary people who want to live life our own way. We want to be able to get to the end of life and say, I did it my way. And those who reach the end of life and do it their way will find that 
their life ends in destruction that's eternal. As I look at that picture and I go back to that and I was that sinner hanging on the precipice and God had sent people in my life to share the gospel in different ways, different times and I was that sinner blind to my own sin and about to plummet to eternal destruction and I would not take the hand of God. So what did God do? He reached down and took my hand. And he turned my heart from sin and self-absorption and opened my eyes to the glory of his grace. He granted me the gifts of faith and repentance and I turned and trusted Christ. Because my nature and your nature is right there. But in the day God reached his hand forward and he saved me, he changed my nature. Now that old man is still with me. That old sin nature is still there. And there are times where I want to be obstinate and contrary. Just ask my wife, she can tell you. But God has changed my heart. And more than anything else, I want to obey him. I want to love him. And I want to serve him with my life. He changed my nature. What about you? Is that your life? Has God rescued you? Or are you still hanging on by your fingertips saying, no, no, I'm okay. I can make it. I can pull myself up. Where are you today spiritually? Believer this morning, do you rescue how much, do you, do you realize do you rightly, truly, rightly value the amazing gift that God has given you in Christ? Is he really a treasure in your heart? If so, I hope today, I hope today we've learned a little bit from the word of God what that ought to look like in our life. Beautiful feet, taking the good news of the gospel to all because they all need to hear. Let's pray.